I think one of the, I'm gonna just put this up here. I think one of the best ways to identify what camp people are in is to understand when their formative coming to Christ happened. So it doesn't matter how old they are. If they came to Christ in the 70s, now you know where they fall. If they came to Christ in the 90s, there's a whole different deal. So just, I think that's a helpful thing. And especially as you're dealing with us parents. Um, I'm gonna actually set my own timer here because Ben said I had to be responsible. And I am a parent. Um, so if I can find my, my timer again, because you know, I'm also a boomer. Um, and I don't know how to use technology. It's actually kind of funny, I apologize. I don't have any, um, any PowerPoint, which if you know me is kind of odd, but I don't. So I'm just gonna talk to you and you have to listen. There are four things as a parent that I really want you to hear today. Um, and, and please know that I am a credentialed pastor. I've served in ministry and vocational ministry for, I don't know, almost 20 years. I've been a parent for almost 27, and I've had kids in student ministry for about 15. So that's where I'm coming from. So I know what your life is like. I know those late nights when you were the last one to leave the church, and you know that the senior pastor has not only had his dinner already, but he's on his second glass of wine, and you're still in the office grinding it out. I know what that's like. So the first thing I wanna to say to you is thank you. I have three great kids. I am blessed with these kids, and people tell me how great my kids are. And the truth is, it's not me, it's not my husband, we tried our best, but it's their experience of having Christ in their lives and having people like you invest in them, let them know what Jesus feels about them and what great lives they can have. That's who my kids are, and it's because of the people like you who spent time with them in those years when they were so difficult to love. The second thing I want to say to you, and now is where you can start knowing that, yes, I am a pastor because I'm heading into alliteration in my points. As parents, we want you to be pastors to our kids. We don't want you to parent our kids. We don't want you to be peers. We don't even want you to be programmers of great activities and events. We want you to be pastors. See, our kids, for the most part, have parents. Some of them have four, five, six parents in their lives. They don't need another parent. Although sometimes I will say ministry looks like parenting. My second son, when he was 15 or 16, was getting ready to go on a backpacking trip with the pastor. I was at church wrangling musicians and worship leaders, so he packed himself. Now the deal was he didn't have the right kind of backpack, so he was gonna take his stuff to the pastor's house and the pastor was gonna repack it in a good backpack. And when he got to the pastor's house and he laid out all this stuff, the pastor said, oh my gosh, we're in major trouble. You can't go backpacking with only this stuff and sent his little sister home to get socks and underwear and warm clothes and all of that. And out of that developed what was known at our church for many years as the Alec Daly Memorial Packing List. I think some kids probably thought some kid died because he didn't pack right. <laughs> so sometimes it looks like parenting, but that came from a heart of a pastor who wanted this kid to have a great experience with God in fellowship on this trip. Don't parent, don't be a peer. I know the great temptation to be relevant and accessible and look like you get it, and I have no problem with that. But when in youth ministry you've gotten to the point where it's all about I listen to the right music and I know all the cultural references and I have the right clothes, you've moved into peerdom and our kids don't need peers. They have lots of them. They have too many of them to try to sort out. Be a pastor. Finally, programming is great, but you don't have to have a great program to be a great spiritual shepherd for my kid. So pay attention to the pastoring. If you're programming, programming out of a heart that loves Jesus and wants my kid to experience that. My second point, and this is probably one of my more important ones, is about peer pressure. 
I cannot tell you the times that I have been frustrated because I am working so hard to teach my kids to resist peer pressure, whether it's to do drugs or to have sex before marriage or to bully or to skip class or to whatever it is. I'm trying my best as a parent to teach my kids that it's okay to say no, stand up for their values. And then they go to youth group. And what I hear is that, oh, well, you know what we did tonight, mom? They brought all these kids up on stage and asked if we really love Jesus, would we do anything? And we said, yes, we love Jesus. And then they're asked to swallow a live goldfish or lick whipped cream off the face of another youth group member. I don't know how many of you do that. Probably nobody in this room does that. Those are some things that scarred my oldest son in his early days in Arizona. So probably not here. And so when I was first thinking about this, I thought, I need to tell you not to use peer pressure. But then I realized peer pressure is what keeps our society going. Peer pressure is an important part of all of our lives, and it can be very positive. Peer pressure is what keeps us driving safely because although we have laws, I know that I have to stay in my lane or I'm going to have an accident because that's the agreement we as a community have made. I'm going to use my signals. I'm going to stop when the light is red. That's all peer pressure. So I'm not going to tell you not to use peer pressure, but what I'm going to tell you is to start using peer pressure wisely. Wise peer pressure involves three things. First of all, it's intentional. If you're using an activity that involves peer pressure, do it because you are using that for a purpose. There's a reason it's building community, it's identifying something that you want the group to see, something. But make sure it's intentional, not just because this is one of your go-to activities and it's fun. Because the problem is those kinds of activities can be actually divisive. If a kid chooses not to participate, how does the group see them? Are they wimps? Were they cowardly? Do they feel like they betrayed the community? Those things can't happen, but if you're intentional about using peer pressure, they won't. The second thing is, make sure it's instructive. When you use peer pressure, let your kids know that's what's going on. They see it every day at school. They see it out in their community. Identify it. Tell them the value of peer pressure. Tell them why we're doing what we're doing. Be instructive. And the third thing I ask about peer pressure is that you be inclusive. Create peer pressure situations and activities that actually allow for kids to say no and stay part of the group. That kid who has the packing list named after him is now working in uh, early childhood ministry and education. And one of the things that he does, when he gets a group of four and five-year-olds and they're going to do an activity, invariably, some kid doesn't want to do it. I don't want to color. I don't like to color. I don't like airplanes. Whatever it is. And as teachers, there can be this, shoot, I need to get everybody involved. I don't have time for this kid to do something different and be off there. I want them to be part of the group. But his response to them being part of the group, his solution is to say, great, you don't like to color. I appreciate that. But because you have to be in this room with me, you can't, there's nowhere else for you to go that's safe. I need you to, to be here and be part of this group. So here's what I need. I need somebody who's going to help me make sure every kid has a picture to color and that everybody has enough crayons. Can you do that? So now we have a kid who got to say no and not succumb to this peer pressure of I have to be like everybody else, but this kid is now part of the group and has a place, has a role, and belongs. And that's what I ask of you for peer pressure. Be inclusive. The final thing that I want to say to you, and some parents will never say this to you out loud, so I'm going to say it to you for them. When you are with me, I want you to be my kid's biggest advocate. I want you to remind me how valuable they are, how smart they are, how kind they are, whatever it is, because some days I don't see it. Some days the bedroom door slams and I'm the worst mom on the planet. 
So when you're with me, remind me how Jesus sees my kid. But when you're with my kid, I want you to be my advocate. I screw up a lot as a parent. Even with three kids, like the third one, I haven't gotten it right yet. And so I want you to tell my kid how much I love them and how much I value them and how much I want the very best for them, how much I want them to know how loved they are by God, how valuable they are, and that he has a big plan for them. I want you to be my advocate. But here's the thing that parents won't tell you, and maybe some of them don't realize it. If you ever have to choose between me and my kid, you darn well better choose my kid. Because you're my kid's pastor. You're not my pastor. You should do it in a way that's God-honoring and relationship-preserving so that we can go on and work that together. But if you don't choose my kid over me, you are not following the calling that God has placed on your life to be in student ministry. So choose my kid. They need to come first. They come first for me, so they darn well better come first for you. So those are the four things that I have for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the work, all the hard nights, all the frustrations, all the days when you want to tear your hair out. Please pastor my kid. They need you as a pastor. Please pay attention to how you're using peer pressure and maybe communicate with me more on that, on how you're doing it and how you see it as helping your kids. And finally, be an advocate, but choose my kid first. So that's what I have for you. Um, I have some questions. Are they here? Oh, look at that. Um, some of these are probably already answered by some of the brilliant people that went ahead of us, ahead of me. Um, so we can go through these questions, but I would like to give you a chance. You've got a parent here. I'm not a contributor to your church's tithe. I don't have any influence with, well, most of your senior pastors. I'm not a risk. What do you want to ask me? Anything? Anything? 